one of the reasons we put up this is not really uh, today's session is not the goal is not to do a product presentation but to comment on the applications we very often hear from customers or integrators that their customer states one of the following two uh, comments that the customer says we need a collaborative robot and that may be the case but it's not always necessarily so or we want to test that this new technology and therefore we want to try a collaborative robot which is a commendable ambition but it's also put some requirements uh, on the application and uh, the customer way of thinking and uh, frankly we would say that in many cases not always of course but in many cases the emphasis has become more on the robot technology than on the application when in reality, it's important that you actually start with the application and then determine the need of the application you have. So, on KUKIA's webpage, the same present, uh, headlines are present six stages of human robot collaboration. And we will copy this more or less during the presentation but dive into each one of these stages a little bit more common uh, deeply and uh, it states six stages but in reality as so often is it's not black and white we will find applications that are somewhere in between these stages or a combination of these stages so in fact we could find a uh, several more than six stages but uh, in principle these are uh, the six fields of uh, application of collaboration and we will start off with the what is typically not called a collaborative robot and that is what we most of us see as the classical robot installation a robot with a fixed safety fence around it and I would dare to say that this is still the majority of all the robot applications. We have a hard guarding which separates the robot from the operator, thereby eliminating any harmful contact with the moving robot or risk of a harmful contact. And if the operator needs to enter the robot zone, there are some safety measures which makes the robot inactive uh, during, when the operator is in the working zone. And in this application, you wouldn't use a collaborative robot, but still it is a very simple form of collaboration. And don't forget, please interrupt me with any questions or comments or protests, if you like. If we then move on to the second stage, it's pretty much the same, but the hard guarding is not 360 degrees around the robot cell. Uh, we instead have some kind of light barrier or uh, equivalent equipment that allows equipment or persons to enter the zone safely. That could be that there is a need of uh, loading or unloading uh, some fixtures or whatever during operation. This is also quite a common robot application and what it's basically done is that the workspace is occasionally shared. And the typical is that there is a hard guard around most of the robot cell and a light barrier replaces some sections. This technology is also to eliminate contact with the working or a robot moving. And is even here not 
a collaborative robot needed. This is quite common using standard robotics. And again, it can be called for a simple form of collaboration. The third level is what we call a fenceless uh, application, a laser scanner separation from the robot. It's like virtual fences, if you like. This application is quite common and well accepted in the industry and by operators uh, among automated guided vehicles. That's a standard solution uh, with them uh, without really any reflection. But it can actually be used together with a standard robot as well, using scanners covering 360 degrees around the robot and creating virtual fences. This is practical to use when you have a frequently shared workspace. An operator uh, coming in the vicinity of the robot quite often, as in the case of a AGV, but not so common with standard robots yet. But we believe that this application will become more and more uh, common as well. Uh, what's important to point out here is not, that in this application, we have to take into consideration the speed and range of what the robot is moved with when the humans enter in the vicinity of the application. But the technology itself is designed to eliminate harmful contact with a moving robot. Again, and in these applications, you could use a collaborative robot, of course, but there is actually not a need for it. This is still typically a standard robot application. And it's quite common, especially, as I mentioned, regarding the AGVs. Any questions so far? Now, the fourth stage of collaboration is an application where we have a shared workspace. That means that basically we have an operator or several operators working in the constantly in the same area as the robot is moving. That means that the robot and the operator are actually sharing the workspace, sharing the work piece, perhaps. So, and the first application here is that the contact it's not really desired or required from the application, but it could still happen since the operators are in the same work in the working space of the robot. Now, therefore, the speed and force of the robot has to be limited, considering the range and the weight, the moving mass of the robot and the workpiece. And in this case, in almost every case, collaborative robots needs to be used. But there are actually solutions of how to handle this application, even here with the standard robots. There are solutions which includes skins uh, on, on a standard robot, which basically puts a sensitive surface on a standard robot to make it sensitive to collisions. But we will dive into that deeper in that specific technology on a separate webinar later on. And this is today probably the most common application field when we talk about collaborative robots. Now, the fifth stage of collaboration is where the robot and the operator is actually performing a task together. Uh, this means that the contact between the operator and the robot is actually required 
uh, typically it could be uh, some kind of simultaneous motion <clears throat> for example lifting or placing a part together where the operator is guiding the robot and again it's in this case very important to consider the speed and force of the robot and limit it so that no harmful uh, event can happen and this does in each case require what we call a, a collaborative robot and this is the truly collaborative app, uh, applications where the operators share uh, the task and Perhaps it could be a little bit unclear what's the difference between the previous stage, stage four, and the stage five is. But the main difference here is that in stage four, the operator and the robot were doing operations in sequence. That means that the operator did some operation first and then the robot uh, filled in with the next operation step and so on. Whereas in stage five, they are actually doing the operation simultaneously, the robot and the operator. That's the main difference between these two stages. Uh, then the sixth application is autonomous collaborative robots. That is basically robots placed on moving vehicles robot that can move around in, in the uh, production area. That means in reality that the robot is sharing a workspace with the humans, a pretty large workspace. Uh, usually contacts with the operator is not desired. We do not want the AGV, for example, to collide with people. But when the AGV is stationary and the robot is working, it could be that this previous stage number five is desired or perhaps not stage number four so it's stage six actually covers in a lot of the previous stages as well combinations of stages are quite possible and uh, of course also in this application the speed and force of both robot and carrier has to be controlled and limited so we don't run the risk of injuring anyone and perhaps your gut reaction is that this must be a collaborative robot is required but in fact it's not really because this technology could be combined with virtual fencing for example as we saw in our stage three so we could actually place a standard industrial robot on an agv and still meet all safety requirements. So in this stage, both standard and collaborative robots uh, are found in use. This application area with movable robots is so far not so frequently found, but we see that there is a huge interest of this application and it's a rapidly growing market for this. So, Running through these six stages, we want to come back to the first statement. We want to test the technology and try a collaborative robot. As a fine, but what robot to use is should always be governed by the application and not the technology. That means basically that if you buy or try out a collaborative robot where actually a collaborative robot is not required, you might end up with the wrong conclusions or a, even a failed project in worst case or a bad project in worst case. So we very much would like to help you when you have a need or uh, want to try this technology. It's equally important that okay fine we want to try a collaborative robot then we you also need to find an area of application where a collaborative robot is suitable and this discussion or analysis is what we would very much like to help you and your customers 
to discuss. So we are ensure that we actually get the right solution for the right application at the end of the day. And as you saw from these stages, when using a collaborative robot, that always means that there are limitations to speed and force in a collaborative space. That means at the end of the day that that has an impact, for example, on cycle times and, and such. So it's far from obvious that you should use a collaborative uh, robot in each case. Uh, so you might think, why am I, it would almost seem that I'm recommending you to not use a, a collaborative robot, but that's in reality not the case. But we, I want to highlight the uh, uh, importance that using it in the right way. Well, it's also important to think about what you have to take into account when installing a collaborative robot. Well, of course, there is a standard which guides you for this, the ISO 10218. But this standard also states that it's not really just sufficient to put in a collaborative robot and then you're safe. You have to do a risk assessment still in the same way and in this case you have to make a risk define the risk in the collaborative operations and take appropriate measures to avoid these risks like earlier there are some guidance to be found on this for example on the ISO 15066 but to make it very short short is that there can be no human robot collaboration without a risk assessment and the whole cell must always be taken into co consideration. A collaborative robot wielding a pair of pliers or a scissor is potentially dangerous, obviously. So, for example, a gripper or a clamping of the robot has to be taken into consideration as well as the robot movement. So putting a collaborative robot into a production doesn't automatically mean that it's safe. Now, as you know, or may know, uh, Kokia supplies two different versions of collaborative robots, the EVA, they are called, and there are two basic versions of them available, the 800 and the 820, and the main difference between these robots is actually the payload they are able to handle, which are seven and 14 kilos, respectively. There's a slight difference in reach, but not very big. For the 800, there is also a clean room, a medical uh, version available as well. Now, why should you then use, and why, when should you use the EVA robot? Well, you should look at the features of it. It is a sensitive robot. That means that it actually has force feedback sensors on each axle, on each movement. That is how it actually detects that it's, for example, colliding with an object or not. And together with that, it has very quick reactions as it feels a, co a collision or an external force uh, upon one of its axles. It can automatically and very quickly react to this. It learns quickly. It, uh, by saying this, we actually mean that it's, you can actually program it by hand guiding the robot to the positions you want it to reach. Instead of writing code, you can by hand teach in the robot movement. It is a very lightweight robot. It's just 28 kilos, so you can easily move it from one application to another. And 
also it has a seven axis compared to the standard robots which usually have six axis which makes it highly flexible and therefore usable in very tight applications for example and just to give you an example here i intend to show you a very short video of one of these applications and where they also are using these features i was talking about earlier Kuka. I hope you saw the video, everyone. And perhaps your reaction was that this was a very strange application because it was not a collaborative application at all. The robots were working on their own without any operator interaction. But what I wanted to show you with this application is that this was in many ways a standard robot application, but here they've used the feature that of force feedback uh, that the robot is sensitive in many of the operations we saw the robot were used feeling its way forward uh, with the assisting following an external movement from the press searching for uh, for the uh, uh, right position when assembling things even in even eliminating uh, a a presence uh, sensor when picking our object because it was feeling if there was an object there or not so these features enables us new ways to think when we choose our applications so if we talk some little bit about these features uh, what the eva can actually do in this case is that it can travel stubbornly to a certain position with high accuracy if we like that means that it could in lack of better words say it's push its way forward uh, softly and gently but still uh, forcibly to the position it needs to reach it can behave as a standard robot of course but we can also add spring stiffness to it uh, compared to a, a standard robot which which cannot move by hand at all uh, in this case you could actually 
gently push the robot and it will flex uh, but then return to its original position when we push it which uh, makes it uh, sensitive to acceleration and that is with a defined force for example and we can also make the application weightless if we like which is very useful in an ergonomic application for example when lifting a heavy object uh, and then be hand guided by an operator for example so these are enablers which we can use in our applications and I think it's important that we all consider that when we use new technologies we open up for new applications as well and just before I end this webinar I would like to send, show you one video more it's just two minutes so Stay tuned of an application which is not a typical industry application, but where they really use the collaborative features of a robot. And that is in the medical field, actually. Robert is a rehabilitation robot designed to attend to the early mobilization of patients who are confined to their beds. It is important to initiate rehabilitation as early as day one of a patient's hospitalization, even though the patients may be weak and incapable of getting out of bed on their own. The practical design of Robert means that it can easily be moved from one room to the next. Therefore, the patient can remain in bed and focus on the therapy, thus avoiding the transfer to a training facility or to another bed. Robert is very easy to start up. Just plug it into an ordinary socket outlet. Robert will then perform a safety test, and thus neither patient nor therapist need worry about safety. A brace will be attached to the patient's lower leg. Then Robert will be rolled up to the bedside and positioned by the patient's legs. The foot brake is activated and Robert will be ready to provide therapy. The therapist directs the robot arm to the brace. The two parts are easily linked up by pressing the robot arm's coupling link onto the brace. The therapist will then push record before performing an individual exercise that is particularly beneficial for this patient. The extent of Robert's pattern of movement is not limited to a set of predefined exercises or directions of movement. When the therapist has demonstrated the exercise, she will press play and Robert, having copied the exercise, will repeat the movement a suitable number of times. Obviously, it is possible to pause the exercise should the patient need a break. Currently, the therapist must perform such exercises manually by repeating activation of the patient's leg into, for instance, flexion, abduction or rotation. Having Robert as her assistant, the therapist will instead have time on her hands to carry out other tasks. Such time could, for instance, be spent talking to the patient or carrying out other patient-related work in the wardroom. Moreover, the physical strain on the therapist will be reduced and thus the risk of work-related muscular pain will be significantly minimized and all the while, the patient will receive optimal physical training. Studies on intensive care patients have demonstrated that the provision of early mobilization will mean that the patient's physical function will have improved when they leave the intensive care unit. It can be concluded that early mobilization is decisive for the optimization of the patient's subsequent development. Early mobilization and very early mobilization contribute to enhanced blood flow and may bring about a reduction in So I think you all saw this application where that is a truly collaborative application. I'm quite sure that we all can find similar applications within both industry, but also outside of typical industry applications for robots. And that is where this technology will rapidly grow over the coming years. Now, before I leave you, I just want to get back to this statement we did earlier that please remember to start off with the application in focus instead of the technology or when you choose technology you have to look at what applications it's suitable because we do see a lot of failed or misplaced uh, collaborative robots into the field uh, in some cases we see applications where customers have placed a collaborative robots of any kind in the middle of a manual operating line and says that uh, well fine 
it, it's a collaborative robot and therefore it's safe. But when we look at the application, the robot is moving much too fast, uh, moving too heavy objects to be actually to be considered as a safe application. So uh, the right technology for the right application is in the imperative uh, lesson to be learned here. And with that, I do thank you for your attention today. I hope you found this fruitful and interesting. Fruitful and interesting.